this week, and I am joined, of course, by my wonderful colleagues, Roger Parloff and Anna Bauer, and we will be giving you the download on everything that is happening in this space. Uh, so to start with, we're actually, we're going to begin in uh, the great state of New York, because despite a flurry of motions by Trump, uh, which the New York appellate courts were not interested in, uh, we are scheduled to begin his trial on Monday with jury selection. Um, so Anna, what's happening? What should we know about, about the, the jury selection process that's happening next week? Um, anything that Trump has tried to knock this train off course? Yeah, Quinta, so we do have jury selection starting on Monday, which is really kind of crazy to think about because it's been over a year now since this indictment was handed down. There's been a lot of twists and turns, and at one point we thought that we'd have another case that went first, but sure enough, this is going to be the first uh, criminal prosecution of a former president in United States history, uh, and it's happening on Monday. Lawfare's Tyler McBrien, who's our managing editor, will be there to cover for Lawfare. Uh, and then later on, when the trial starts, I will be there, as, as will Ben. Quinta and Roger may be making some appearances. Uh, so we are excited to uh, cover the trial. But in terms of jury selection, what you need to know, we learned a lot more about what, how things are going to proceed on Monday because Justice Mershon, uh, who's the presiding judge in the case, sent out this letter to the parties, both the prosecution and the defense, in which he described you know, how he plans to proceed. Uh, and I'm, we have a podcast coming out on Monday that we just recorded today that goes into those procedures in a lot of detail. So I, I want to go through it, but maybe not in as much detail. And But I suggest that people listen on Monday to the Lawfare podcast when that comes out, uh, if you want a kind of more detailed understanding of the jury selection process. Uh, so we basically what will happen, a group of jurors will show up in New York State Court on Monday. Uh, these are people who are just randomly, you know, selected from the voter rolls. They receive a notification in the mail, go to court. Uh, they will appear before Justice Mershon, who will then give them a number of preliminary instructions. So he'll read the case caption, the charges against the defendant. Uh, and then he will give them this, you know, kind of first glance at the case, which is this case summary. Um, interestingly, the case summary that he set out, uh, you know, specifically mentions that the prosecution, uh, you know, is kind of framing this as an election interference case, that these hush money payments uh, were done in order to uh, conceal uh, an agreement with others to unlawfully influence the 2016 presidential election. That's one of the, you know, lines in this case summary. So that's really interesting because it, it sets up and frames that this case is going to uh, be portrayed or likely will be portrayed as an election interference case, even though the charge itself is falsification of business records. Um, so uh, after providing that summary of the case, Justice Mershon will then go through some other pr preliminary instructions, uh, some of the most important uh, of which will be, you know, just setting out what it means to be an impartial juror, who is eligible to serve as a juror in New York State Court, uh, and then he'll, you know, for example, list the names of people who might be witnesses or might be named in the case. The reason for that being that uh, he needs to uh, alert the jurors to that, uh, those identities so that, you know, if they have a personal or familial relationship with those people, which might disqualify them from serving as a juror on the case, then they can self-identify that they're ineligible to serve for that reason, that kind of thing. Uh, and then what usually happens is uh, once he set out these instructions, uh, the judge will ask the jurors to raise their hand if they uh, are electing to self-identify as being ineligible to serve. Uh, and after people raise their hand saying, I'm not eligible to serve, usually they will then go up to the judge, you know, go up to the bench, uh, the defense goes up and the prosecution goes up as well. And then they kind of have to explain like why it is that they're not eligible to serve. You know, maybe they can't, they don't feel they can be impartial. Maybe they 
uh, are disqualified because they know one of the witnesses very well, that kind of thing. Um, but in this particular case, it's a little bit different because Justice Mershon, uh, you know, found that basically that usual process was going to be a little bit trickier because the courtroom is just like too small to like deal with all of the Secret Service and Defense Counsel and Prosecution and everyone who's going to be packed in there covering the case. There would just be too many logistical issues with kind of doing this usual process and it would be too drawn out and inefficient. So what he decided to do instead is that instead of having this individual interview with the jurors, he will just dismiss outright anyone who elects to say, uh, hey, I'm not eligible to serve. Uh, and so anyone who raises their hand will then be dismissed. Uh, and then we proceed to the voir dire process. That's the process by which uh, the jurors answer questions. Um, and then they are questioned uh, by both the prosecution and the defense who get the opportunity, get a certain amount of time to uh, question jurors. Uh, they kind of go out in groups and read out the answers that they gave to this jury questionnaire. Uh, we got a look at that questionnaire. It is 42 questions. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about the substance of that if you want. But it, it, it basically it, it asks things like, you know, what kind of media do you consume? Or, um, you know, have you ever been a proud boy? <laughs> so things that are kind of proxies. Are you a member of Antifa? Which I guarantee <laughs> yeah. you, nobody who would identify themselves as Antifa would identify themselves as a member of Antifa on a court document. Exactly. Uh, but so questions like that that serve as a proxy for some type of information that the defense or the prosecution wants to know and can give them kind of a, an idea of who the juror is. Um, and and then, you know, after that uh, initial period when everyone's writing notes about what the answers to this questionnaire, uh, uh, what how they answered the questionnaire questions, then each side kind of has an opportunity to question the jurors, ask them, you know, certain types of questions, although it's really up to Justice Mershon if they can, there are some questions that maybe he will say, you know, you can't ask that. I think one of them, Roger, correct me if I'm wrong, was just like they wanted to ask, do you like Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. uh, and and Justice Mershon said, no, I, <laughs> I don't want you to ask that question. Um, so uh, so that's kind of how that goes. And then there will be a process, you know, for exercising certain types of challenges in which they, both the prosecution and the defense, are trying to get rid of jurors that they maybe don't want on the jury. Uh, and there are two different types of challenges. There's for, for cause challenges. Uh, those are unlimited, uh, and they relate to either a juror's inability to be impartial, um, or they relate to an, a, a juror's ineligibility to serve. So things like under New York state law, uh, maybe you live outside of Manhattan. That means that you can't then sit as a juror in a Manhattan criminal case. Uh, so, so you can have these four cause challenges, but then you have peremptory challenges as well. Uh, and that's more of like, things that, you know, basically anything that the uh, prosecution or defense wants, as long as it's not within a certain number of categories, like race, for example. Um, and if, if, one, I, if either side believes that a peremptory challenge has been, uh, you know, used in a way that was improper, uh, for example, based on race, uh, then, you know, they can challenge that peremptory challenge itself or raise an objection to it. So there's kind of this process of back and forth there with all of that. Um, and then this goes on and on in several rounds uh, with several rounds of different groups of jurors until we finally end up with a group of 12 jurors and six, I think it'll be six alternates, but maybe he'll do more. Um, but, uh, but that's usually, you know, 12 jurors, six alternates, uh, in a case like this. So that is the process that you can expect. Did I miss anything, Roger? Uh, no, that sounds good. Um, uh, not, I don't think I have anything to add. I just, uh, mentioned that, uh, Justice Merchan, uh, uh, did handle the, uh, people versus, uh, Trump organization case, uh, in uh, that uh, maybe a year ago. And uh, so he, he knows the ropes here a little, and that's, he 
went through a jury selection process in a very similar case, and, and that's part of what's informing his uh, 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 ideas about how to streamline this because uh, uh, he, he found some things that got bogged down and achieved little last time around, and I, I think the lawyers didn't resist much. I think they agreed. And do we have any sense of how long the jury selection process might take? I think that I think it's estimated to be. I, I want to say that jury selection. When there was, I, I went to a hearing back in March in uh, uh, Mar-a-Lago before Judge Cannon. She asked about the timing of jury selection plus the trial. I I think that they said like two to three weeks jury selection could last. I think that's about right. I don't expect it to really go over two to three weeks. Um, it could, especially because Justice Mershon has decided to dismiss jurors who self-identify as being ineligible to serve outright and not have that you know, interview process, I, I think that'll save a lot of time. So you know, it could go even quicker. Like it, it, we could see opening statements you know, April 22nd, that, mo that next Monday. So we'll see, but um, I, I don't expect it to go over two to three weeks. I, uh, you know, I watched the uh, jury selection in the Proud Boys case in D.C., which um, uh, there was a lot of problem getting jurors that, you know, uh, felt they could be fair there. And, but it still it went about two weeks, I, I, is, is how I remember. And uh, now the federal system is a little more, only the judge asks questions there. So uh, with the, the uh, but at the same time, there were also five defendants there, which made it complicated as well. So I think two weeks is sort of a reasonable guess. I mean, so would it be fair to say in that case that, you know, if you've seen the headlines that say Trump trial starts Monday and you're expecting there to be, a, you know, a big bang and lots of excitement uh, that you are in for some disappointment because what we're probably going to have is two weeks of arguing over, you know, whether the fact that someone moved to New York from Florida shows that they're biased. I mean, I think for the lay person, it is very true that jury selection would be- And Anna <laughs> wants to defend jury selection. <laughs> I love jury selection because <laughs> it is like the most important part of a case and it can make or break a case. And it's really interesting to see how people respond to these questions, to see the strat, it's a game of strategy. Uh, you know, it's, it's really fascinating to me, but I do think everyone else would probably be really bored. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we'll see. Uh, but yeah, Roger, what about you? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think most people would not consider it the most exciting part of the case, but, um, but you're right. It's, it's crucial. It's absolutely crucial. So, and you know, uh, sometimes it's inspiring, uh, uh, if, if you believe in the jury system. Um, and um, so I, I, I do expect that at the end of it, we will hear more motions to um, move the case out of Manhattan. We've seen they can't be fair. It's too many that, um, so there will be last ditch uh, motions like that, but I don't think they'll be, they'll be successful. Yeah, and one other thing to mention that we haven't is that this will be an anonymous jury, uh, except not anonymous to the parties and their counsel, but uh, they, the, these instructions that Justice Mershon will give are very careful to ensure that you know the jurors are not revealing their addresses and, and names when they're doing voir dire. Uh, there, the court has also said, you know, no sketches of juror. There's no cameras in the courtroom, of course, but you know, there's a prohibition on sketches in the courtroom as well. So uh, people will know some things about the jury that's ultimately selected based on their answers to the questions in court. Uh, but uh, there are other, other things that we won't know, um, and it, it won't be kind of as prone to, you know, internet sleuths going and snooping on jurors, social media, and all that, although certainly defense counsel will be doing that. So 
Um, yeah, it, it'll be a very interesting, or, or interesting to me and to Roger and to Tyler, who's covering it. Um, but uh, I, I think I'm excited for it. And, and remember that political registration, political contributions, that's all open source information. So the, the parties will have access to that, even though we, we don't. We don't. All right, anything else we want to touch on in New York before we move south? Oh, th uh, there's, a, there's a slew of uh, last-ditch uh, mandamus uh, petitions uh, this week, uh, three so-called Article 78 petitions. The uh, Trump has been, uh, uh, they've mainly been trying to uh, get adjournments while other issues are litigated. So far, all of those have been denied by a, by a single justice of the appellate division first department uh, and all of those will be heard by a full panel of uh, five justices just the stay part of it um, but and that'll probably happen Monday but um, we're not really expecting any of those to actually delay the start okay, let's Take a hop, skip, and a jump down to uh, to Florida, where Roger Judge Cannon has been. I don't know if busy is the right word, but she's she's done some things. She she has. Um, I I might say busy. The the one thing that's uh, that I consider big is you know she had this question. She was she had issued an order on February sixth where she was going to uh, unseal the names of almost two dozen witnesses or FBI agents, um, as well as uh, their uh, testimony or their statements to the FBI, what we usually call Jenks material, um, which isn't usually turned over until the witness testifies uh, after the, uh, or, you know, a few hours before. Um, and uh, she was gonna make all of this public, the, the government was, and she made an order to this effect. It didn't go into effect. Uh, the, the government moved to reconsider, made it clear that if she persisted, they would take her to the 11th Circuit on this. And she sort of backed down. Uh, she mainly backed down. Uh, it was a 24-page order. It was extremely uh, defensive. Um, it was, uh, um, you know, in order to do a motion to reconsider, you have to, you know, the only way you're entitled to it is you have to argue that as things stand, it's clearly erroneous and a manifest injustice. She took that very personally, like, uh, and so she tried to show, well, it might be erroneous, but it's not clearly erroneous. And, and, um, and then she said, and she said, uh, you know, I don't have to do this, but I, uh, I'm going to do it. Um, so she backed down, but and in fairness to her, um, uh, the uh, special counsel didn't handle this correctly. Um, I think they, they, you know, they assumed that she would understand the sensitive of this information sensitivity and agree with it. You know, she was. Uh, in the Southern District of Florida U.S. Attorney's Office for seven years, um, you you would think she might. Uh, she certainly didn't. And then the Press Coalition uh, filed uh, uh, a brief, um, and of course takes the position the Press Coalition always does. Uh, you know, make everything public because th they expect. Um, you know, uh, that's their job, and they expect the government to, to push back. The government didn't push back. They said, it, it was very strange. They said, uh, well, we disagree that um, uh, the press coalition has a right to intervene. We don't think they have a right to intervene. They explained why. They said, now, if you want to submit an amicus brief, we leave that to you. And they didn't engage with any of the arguments, which was, uh, and so she adopted wholeheartedly all of those arguments. And um, and so uh, can, I, can I ask, is, is your read here just that she genuinely didn't understand that what the government was kind of assuming that she would understand about the sensitivity of that material? Um, I, 
I, it seems, you know, look, I, I, there, she goes into these things believing that everything Trump argues is probably right. And, you know, there is that. Uh, and, and, you know, it's unmistakable. And she, there's a, she's been angry with the special counsel from day one. So I don't know, you know, but she does seem to, I think she has a sort of a, uh, she can't see the forest for the trees thing. She gets caught up in the rules and, uh, and, and she doesn't look at, in this case, you know, there are a lot of different, the courts have struggled with this question, well, which sorts of discovery documents can be, uh, you know, uh, should be made public and, and not. And, and so I think they've made some silly decisions where they said, well, if it's a motion to compel, um, it, it doesn't, maybe it's, a, you know, it's not a very strong reason to make it public, but if it's a motion to dismiss, it's more, I mean, really, you have to look at the document. And here, you know, there is a statute, uh, 18 U.S.C. 3500, that talks about Jenks material. You know, it says th this is categorically sensitive and it's not discoverable. And the whole, so, you know, if, if the government had never turned it over in the first place, we wouldn't be here. But they wanted to accelerate things, and there was a protective order in place, so they thought, look, we're going to try to let things go as fast as possible. Maybe we can get a trial quickly. And so they turned it over subject to this protective order. And now uh, Trump has been trying to, you know, uh, make public all of the witnesses' names, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, very dangerous. And um, and so she went along. Um, so I, I, I just can't tell exactly uh, what's going through her mind. But anyway, she backed down as far as witness identities, but not the statements themselves. And so she says, if you redact the identities, the biographical information that might identify them in the statement, then you can use the statement. So it's going to be up to Jack Smith whether that's worth trying to mandamus. Um, I, I think the answer is probably no, but it's, it's an ongoing qu question. Uh, uh, like we're having a hearing on Friday on three motions involving, in, in the, in the in Mar-a-Lago case, involving uh, Nauta and de Oliveira only. And um, there is some stuff, especially in the Nauta, one of the Nauta motions, that is currently sealed, and she wants to make most of it um, public. Again, she'll, she'll protect the identities nominally. So it's up to Jack, whether, Jack Smith, whether can you really protect identities that way? And also there are other reasons this stuff is kept secret. Witness statements, you know, in a criminal case, it sometimes happens that the accused criminal is a criminal. And sometimes, you know, if you tell criminals what the evidence is, they'll manufacture evidence or, you know, they'll tailor testimony to try to uh, circumvent what the government has against them. And so you don't turn it over now. You can and also, if it makes a splash, uh, the jurors will find out about it. Um, so there's a lot of other reasons that this is normally kept secret. So it's going to be up to Jack Smith to decide, can he live with this sort of ruling, which is not going away. It's a, it's a continuing issue. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, there is this hearing um, Friday, the three there's a, I can't tell you a lot about it because all three motions are still undocketed. This is another issue. But um, two of them are motions for a bill of particulars by Nauta and uh, uh, de Oliveira. Those are pretty technical. There's a motion to dismiss by Nauta that is apparently about alleges vagueness and, and has He's claiming that the obstruction of justice charges um, 
in particular are vague in some way and that, that might be affected by the, there's a ruling coming up, uh, well, there's a Supreme Court argument next week called United States versus Fisher, we'll come back to, which doesn't really involve these, these charges. But anyway, um, what a couple of things that strike me though is that, you know, uh, often, like Judge Chutkin, does not hold hearings very often because it's time consuming and it doesn't usually, you know, you read the briefs, you, you get the picture, you, you rule. Um, it, it, sometimes it'll help. With the gag order, she did hold a hearing because it was very important, First Amendment issues and so on. This is the, you know, a bill of particulars. These are things that are not, you know, a lot of, many judges would not have ordered hearings uh, and it makes you wonder, you know, there are 14, there were 14 motions, there is now 12 still left to be decided. Um, uh, one wow. motion to compel and, and uh, 11 uh, motions to dismiss or bill of particulars or motion to suppress. And um, does she plan to hold hearings on all of them? And uh, yeah, and 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 the defendants want hearings, obviously, on all of them. Uh, the, uh, take a, and they've asked for evidentiary hearings on at least ten of them so far. Thanks goodness she hadn't ord ordered that. But um, so uh, that's uh, that's a, a concern. Um, I, there are some other. Yeah, things and Roger, like, just yeah. real quick on that point. I, yeah. I mean, it's worth noting that, for example, the government's proposed schedule did build in, you know, I mean, I think at first they just said like one day for motions hearings or something, but then they have ultimately kind of said, okay, well, a lot like three days in a row, it'll be, it, they wanted like a marathon because it's just more efficient that way. You know, the, these parties are coming in from out of state. It's really hard to get to Fort Pierce. Uh, it makes sense as just an efficient a judicial efficiency uh, and, you know, resources and time perspective to go ahead and set all these motions for hearing if she's going to hear them all have them come down for like a day or two get it over with but instead she's doing this really kind of like scattered process where you'll get a few motions that you know she'll and then motions that don't need all day hearing she will hear them you know for hours so it's just a really uh, underscores some of the just more strange ways that she is handling things yeah absolutely absolutely um and uh, it's, we're not sure, um, this one, she's not going in the order, the first two she heard were the first two that um, uh, the defendant, that Trump, that the defense team wanted. Uh, then they wanted, I mean, their, their highest priority is something called a, a motion to compel, which would get them a ton more uh, discovery that would take a long time in itself, and they could, you know, uh, uh, there would be still more documents to attach to motions and, and have fights over. Um, and she hasn't done that one yet. And of course now, I, th I think these three just, in, since these three just involve not Trump, she originally set the meeting, for, uh, the hearing for April 19th, and so, uh, the Trump trial in New York would be underway, so I think she thought, okay, so I'll just do these three that, that aren't uh, that aren't Trump. But um, uh, we're getting bogged down at this point. And um, uh, also this week, uh, yesterday, yeah, yesterday she she did something interesting. She ordered that. Um, uh, expert disclosures and the SEPA Section 5 notice uh, should be filed on May 9th. And um, now, uh, so that is um, seven weeks uh, later than the government had hoped. And, and the original date was November, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. But I mean... Uh, uh, so we're, we're only like, running a few months behind schedule. Yeah, I mean, both right before, Mar remember, there was an all-day hearing March 1st about when the new trial date should be, and then, and so for that, both sides put a new schedule in, and uh, so th these dates would be seven weeks 
later than the government want. They would be, however, five and eight weeks earlier, uh, respectively, than, than Trump wanted. Um, but uh, the Section 5 notice, that's a thing where um, the defense notifies the government and the, and the, and the court of which classified documents it is going to want to use that'll be you know that won't be a public uh it's going to want to present and um the thing is uh as uh, brian greer noted he he goes on twitter as uh, secrets and uh law uh he's a former cia uh general counsel or, or attorney and um uh he noted that you can't really do the section five notice until the motion to compel is decided. Um, so, you know, that could mean she plans not to grant the motion to compel, or it could mean she didn't think about that. Um, so uh, we'll have to, to see um, how realistic that is. Uh, there was one other thing that I thought, re oh, I'm sorry, did you wanna say something, Anna? I was just going to say that I seem to recall, I need to look back at my notes, but there were, there was a, at the March 1st hearing, there was a time when there, it was raised this question of maybe multiple rounds of certain types of SEPA litigation, which is not usually what happens, but it seemed mm -hmm. that at the March 1st uh, hearing, she was contemplating that. Uh, certainly the uh, Trump talked about that and we, it, 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 she, yeah, and when she decided most of the SEPA Section 4 stuff, she did indicate there would have to be a follow-up SEPA Section 4 thing. Um, one, one little thing, she, uh, you know, the government every month files on, under the local rules something called a speedy trial report, and, um, uh, and the last eight of them, there's been no dispute. The defense concurs in every one. Um, but she asked on April 2nd, she asked that the defense team specifically file their own speedy trial report um, and discuss whether they're asserting or waiving their speedy trial rights, and if so, within what time frames. Uh, so it sounded to me like um, she's... Uh, going to formally reset the trial date pretty soon and she wants to get her ducks in a row as far as the speedy trial uh situation the speedy trial act is a pretty uh weak statute it, it, it gives you're supposed to hold the trial within 70 days of the first appearance but with a slew of exceptions and uh we so far uh we have not used one day of uh, the 70 day clock. It's been told, meaning stopped for various reasons. And it stopped until May 20th, and then it starts counting again. And so I think she's anticipating. And in response to that, um, the defense uh, uh, did provide a great deal of advice about how, how she could delay forever uh, without uh, using up uh, a time. Uh, and one of the ways was, you know, each time you file a motion that tolls the clock until, um, I forget the ma magic language, um, uh, until certainly until after the hearing and then a certain amount of reasonable time to decide it, maybe 30 days, and it could be maybe 30 days after post-hearing briefs. So you might think, there are a lot of ways to make this go on forever. So where, where do we stand on this week's uh, uh, evaluation of the question of what, what exactly Judge Cannon is, is doing? <laughs> well, what, it, what is motivating all this? Well, she's certainly, so far, she's successfully avoiding 11th Circuit review. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, but, and I don't think this documents thing is where um, uh, Jack Smith wants to plant his flag, but I might be wrong. It depends how, you know, only he knows how damaging having all of these documents be partially exposed in this way is. He, like I say, it's not the perfect record for him because he sort of screwed up in not 
procedurally uh, earlier, but um, still, um, uh, the, it is uh, something he could do. The, the, the scariest thing is clearly that jury instruction uh, 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 tumult we had uh, last week that we talked about. And um, I think she covered herself. It would be very, very hard for him to go to the 11th Circuit because basically she said, look, I'm just acting in good faith. I'll make my decision the way every judge does during, uh, during the trial. We'll have a jury conference and then uh, that's when it's usually done. So you would really have to, you know, have the 11th Circuit say she's not being candid with us. Uh, and there's no basis, I mean, for doing that. So uh, it's, a, I don't know, uh, it's not a very optimistic uh, situation. Well, maybe uh, Boy Wonder Judge McAfee can, can cheer us up. <laughs> Anna, what's been, what's been going on in Georgia? So Boy Wonder continues to Boy Wonder, or I mean, I, not really. I mean, he's fine, but he's, it's not like he's done anything, you know, uh, super impressive. Uh, uh, but um, he, he did uh, hand down a, an order today, uh, or excuse me, uh, this week. Um, and so he continues to show that he's working on these motion, these substantive motions. Uh, he, even though Trump is still trying to appeal that disqualification order, and we're waiting for the Court of Appeals in Georgia to decide on that. Um, it, it, he, Judge McAfee, again said, you know, the case isn't paused. I'm going to continue to crank out these orders. And he did just that this week. He issued an order denying uh, Kathy Latham's motion to strike uh, Act 160 from the indictment. Uh, that description deserves a little bit of explaining. Um, if people remember how this RICO indictment is kind of set up, is that you have all these different series of acts within the indictment, um, and uh, there are certain overt acts that the state has to prove that, uh, you know, either the defendant or their co-conspirators did in terms of, you know, proving up this racketeering uh, charge, which is the top uh, charge in the indictment. Um, and Act 160 accuses Kathy Latham, who is the former Coffee County Republican chairwoman, uh, who is alleged to be involved in the Coffee County voting system breach. Uh, she is alleged in Act 160 to have committed perjury during a federal court proceeding uh, in a civil suit called Curling versus Raffensburger. That suit is the one that, uh, you know, led to the discovery of the Coffee County voting system breach. Uh, Latham sat for a deposition in that case, uh, and Fulton County prosecutors now claim that she perjured herself during that suit. But Latham is not actually accused of the substantive crime of perjury, which is a little bit confusing. Uh, but in, in a RICO uh, prosecution, you don't even have to charge someone with a separate crime uh, you know, you can just say that they committed a certain, you know, they, she committed perjury in federal court, but they don't even have to charge her with perjury uh, as, as a substantive offense. They just have to be able to say that as an overt act, uh, it, furthering the conspiracy to overturn the election, she committed perjury, uh, the reason being, you know, that they alleged she was trying to basically cover up uh, the Coffee County voting system breach. So she filed this motion in which she said that because she, uh, this conduct is alleged to have occurred in federal court, only federal law could apply, um, and that therefore, you know, that act needs to be struck from the indictment. Um, and uh, Judge McAfee said no. Uh, he said, you know, you cite one case, and even like taking this case, even if it was correct, 
it still want to apply because here Kathy Latham has not been charged substantively with perjury. This is just an overt act that is alleged to be part of the racketeering scheme to overturn the election. Uh, and so therefore, you know, it's inapp inapplicable. Um, and it's basically, sorry, uh, it's Act 160 is staying in the RICO indictment. Uh, so Kathy Latham can still appeal uh, she has, like everyone else who tries to, to seek an appeal pre-trial in Fulton County, um, she has to get Judge McAfee to issue a certificate of immediate a, a appeal within, excuse me, a certificate of immediate review within 10 days of when the order was issued. Uh, that is affects basically a permission for her to then go to the Court of Appeals and try to get an interlocutory appeal from them. Uh, so that's kind of where we are with that. And then at the same time, we had Fonnie Willis's response to Trump's appeal of the disqualification uh, order in which Judge McAfee declined to disqualify Fonnie Willis on the basis of her relationship with Nathan Wade and then extrajudicial statements that she made outside of court. Uh, and the response, there's not really much new in it, you know, other than the state says that defense counsel didn't meet their burden for seeking an interlocutory appeal. The, the court should decline to hear the appeal prior to trial. Uh, and, you know, basically the trial judge got it right. Uh, but something that did stick out to me is that in this brief, you know, usually in a brief, you have several different points and you try to put the ones that you're like most worried about or that you think is your strongest argument like up at the top. Uh, and I mean, it's not always how it works, but it's kind of a good rule of thumb. Um, and in this brief, they really focused a lot at the top part of the brief on the forensic misconduct uh, allegations. So those are the allegations that, you know, Fonnie Willis went to this church and made these out of court statements um, that prejudiced the defendants. Um, that's what they call forensic misconduct in Georgia. That can be a, a way to disqualify a district attorney. Uh, and, and, you know, of course, they're arguing that she didn't commit forensic misconduct. And certainly Judge McAfee did find that she didn't, didn't rise to the level of forensic misconduct, but he did say things that were like, you know, there's not a lot of case law on this and it was legally improper for her to say these things. So I think that it, it really indicates that, um, you know, uh, <laughs> that this is something that the district attorney's office is maybe most worried about in terms of whether the Georgia Court of Appeals will take up um, the case uh, because they really deprioritize these other issues of, you know, the findings on the relationship with Nathan Wade. Um, but that, oh, and there's one more thing that happened in Fulton County, Quinta. Do you want to hear it? No. <laughs> okay. So uh, if people might recall that uh, last, oh gosh, summer of 2022 now. I wanted yeah, to cast say last your mind summer. back. To the if summer you can, so much has <laughs> happened since then. Uh, but when Bonnie Willis first really got going with this investigation, she was investigating the fake electors. Uh, she was investigating a lot of, uh, you know, politicians in Georgia, some of whom ended up being indicted. Uh, but one of those people was Georgia's current lieutenant governor, Burt Jones. Uh, and Fonnie Willis was disqualified from investigating him in the summer of 2022. The reason being that she held a fundraiser for Charlie Bailey, who at the time was Burt Jones' political opponent in the lieutenant governor's race in Georgia. So she was subsequently disqualified. And the way that it works, of course, if a district attorney is disqualified, then the uh, case is referred to a nonpartisan state agency called the Prosecuting Attorneys Council. Uh, there's a guy in charge of that, of the PAC, as we call it. Uh, his name is Pete Scandalakis. Um, and he looked for many months uh, to find someone who might take the case. Uh, it, he, you know, there was, there was a good amount of criticism of PAC for, you know, taking uh, over a year and a half to appoint someone to investigate Burt Jones. 
Um, and today we learned that Pete Scandalakis has appointed himself to, <laughs> <laughs> to to investigate Burt Jones. Um, and and you know he, he just, did, he was the most qualified man for the job. There was well, simply well, nobody like, else. So, so again, I want to stress that I think one of the you know they did have a number of candidates they were thinking to appoint, but it's a really low pay, it's, um, you know, a politically sensitive investigation, that kind of thing. Uh, so we do have someone who is going to investigate Burt Jones. Uh, the statute of limitations, I believe, is coming up. So, um, it, you know, I think that it's four years for uh, felony charges. Uh, and I think that'll be December 2020, December, January 2024. Um, oh wow! So the clock is really ticking. So yeah, um, and it wasn't. And then, there's no. There's no tolling that happens. Well, well I, that's then. what I don't. And that's okay. what I don't know. I I haven't looked into it far enough to know whether there's issues with tolling and you know that kind of thing. But uh, but yeah. So the it, the statute of limitations that clock is I, ticking. Um, and then uh, we also don't know exactly what the scope of this investigation will be. You know, initially, Burt Jones, he was a fake elector. He was a state senator at the time. Uh, he is someone who was involved in that. But also, I uh, attended the, the case I mentioned that uncovered the Coffee County breach, Curling versus Raffensperger, that civil suit. They had a trial in January which I attended, and during that trial, there was evidence presented in which, uh, and I have the, you know, I pulled up the exhibit just to read it. Um, it this is a, an email that was presented at trial from Michael Barnes, who worked in the Georgia Secretary of State's office, uh, and this was December 22nd, and he wrote to a number of people in the Georgia Secretary of State's office saying, uh, Butts County just called me. Butts County is uh, where Burt Jones is from. Butts County just called me. Tina, the election supervisor or someone involved in elections there, is saying that Senator Burt Jones has talked to her election board chairman and wants to bring a forensic analyst to inspect their election management computer. I told Tina to immediately contact Chris to make him aware of this effort. And then Ryan Germany responded that this would be against the law. They are not allowed to give an unauthorized person access to their EMS server. That would be a huge security breach. Uh, so there were some people who were suggesting that maybe uh, this aspect of, uh, you know, uh, Burt Jones' conduct also maybe should be investigated. I do not know if that is something that Sp Pete Scandalakis has uh, plans to look into, um, but just did want to note it because that was a kind of more recent development earlier this year where that came to light. Uh, so that's all that's happening in Fulton County, Quinta. All right, well, let's move it on up to Washington, D.C. Um, and this is actually, I'm going to pass the baton to you, Anna, for the, the hosting uh, job here, because we're going to be talking about the briefing in the Trump immunity case before the Supreme Court, which uh, I, I have read and I have thoughts on. Right. So for the D.C. case, which we, we do not get a lot of D.C. case uh, action these days. Um, but we did get some this week because uh, Jack Smith filed the their uh, brief before the Supreme Court on the presidential immunity appeal. Uh, arguments are set to happen April 25th in that case. Um, and so, Quinta, why don't you tell us about it? What did Smith argue? Uh, and, you know, what's the give us the kind of what we need to know? I think that this is pretty consistent with um, Smith's past filings in this. It's essentially saying, you know, there there is no absolute immunity here for uh, for president, excuse me, for former presidents for conduct that occurred during their presidency, and anyway, even if there is, it's narrower than what Trump is asking for here. Um, I think in, in my view, what's particularly interesting here is kind of a back and forth that is happening between Trump and Smith over uh, something that's called the clear statement rule, which is very complicated and which I will give a very, very high altitude overview of here. Essentially, 
the argument, um, this is something that comes out of the Office of Legal Counsel, so sort of the in-house think tank for the Justice Department, is that if a statute doesn't explicitly, if a criminal statute does not explicitly identify the president, then it doesn't apply to him. Um, that is massively oversimplified, but I think it'll it'll do for the purposes of, of this conversation. Um, and Trump uh, raised that in his Supreme Court brief, though he didn't address it uh, in the briefing below, to say, well, look at this. How can these criminal statutes possibly apply, possibly apply to me, given that I was the president at the time? Um, and so Smith is kind of pushing back on that here and essentially says, you know, look, if you look at the same OLC memos that Trump is drawing on in making this argument, they actually don't say, you know, a, a criminal statute has to explicitly say, yes, we mean the president too, in order for it to apply to the president. Um, for example, there's an OLC memo that says, you know, the bribery statutes apply to the president, even though they don't say, also, you can't do a bribe if you're the president. Right, um, because the president has no constitutional authority to take a bribe. And we know that because he can be impeached for it. So bribery is unusually clear cut in that sense. But Smith is essentially saying here, you know, we can extend that principle more broadly to say that we don't need to worry about the clear statement rule in instances in which the president doesn't have any constitutional authority to begin with because we wouldn't need to be worried about Congress, and in this case, the courts infringing on that power because it doesn't exist to begin with. Um, there's also a uh, hefty portion of the brief that is sort of calling Trump out on uh, some of the misrepresentations, I think it's fair to say, <laughs> that he, he made in his brief before the Supreme Court, sort of fudging his citations, suggesting that uh, that a uh, number of OLC memos, uh, court cases, law review articles by, among other people, Brett Kavanaugh, um, had to do with protection, immunity protections for a former president, um, as well as uh, a sitting president, and essentially saying he's, he's extending this in ways that just simply don't make sense, given that he is no longer in office. Um, so I will say that was a bit cathartic for me because uh, I, I had been tearing my hair out a little bit reading Trump's brief and, and seeing uh, exactly how he had kind of misframed and misstated things in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that the, the other thing that I want to note before I hand it over to you, Roger, to talk about the, what this says about the Fisher case um, is Smith's suggestion for how the court should sort of handle this procedurally. And essentially what he says here is, okay, so you know, if the Supreme Court says no immunity under any circumstances, that makes it easy. We can just kick it back to the district court and move forward. If the court instead, instead says, well, yes, there is some immunity, but does it apply here? We don't know. Um, you can imagine a world in which that leads to a lot more litigation um, over the course, you know, then it stretches things out <laughs> even more as Smith and Trump go back and forth over these issues. Um, and so what Smith proposes um, essentially is that the district court should be able to handle this over the course of the trial. And that the Supreme Court should, in that case, remand it to the district court, and that the district court will then be able to address this, and I'm re quoting here, uh, through evidentiary and instructional rulings at trial, essentially saying, let's just kind of fold it all together. Um, and this is essentially a way of saying, you know, we really want to get this moving forward. <laughs> like, can we please, please, please get to trial here? Um, so so I think is, is, are you saying the fear animated, like what's animating this is the fear that the Supreme Court will say, yeah, there are some, there's some level of immunity for uh, you know, former presidents uh, when it comes to criminal prosecutions, uh, but we need to send this back for an evidentiary hearing maybe to figure out you know, what is official or, and, and, or what, is that the concern? And then that would then risk you know, the case going back up in terms of distinguishing what's official and not official or is there something at, like what? What is that's, the kind that's of? That's how I read it. Certainly, okay. Roger. I don't know if you have thoughts. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's ex exactly how I read it too, because that's one of the biggest things people fear is that 
they would send this back for more findings and that those could be appealed and then you would never, mm -hmm. you know, this wouldn't be decided. There's no way. So uh, the, he's asking, he's asking the court to be clear that if there are findings to be made, they can be made by the district judge at trial as evidentiary rulings and in the jury instructions, and then you can appeal those after, after, uh, if, if. And what did you guys make? I mean, do you think, what did you make of that argument? Convincing? I thought it made sense. I mean, it's hard, it's kind of hard to say without getting a sense of what the court is, is thinking, right? I mean, I think Smith would much prefer it if the justices just say, nope, no absolute immunity, you know, goodbye, yeah. go back to the district court. So this is kind of trying to uh, uh, help him out a little bit um, as kind of a backstop. I think it really sort of gets into, you know, uh, the uh, how much you believe that the Supreme Court is, that this is all an exercise in legal theory or whether sub, some subconsciousness, subconsciences are at work here. And some people in their subconscious do not want this case to take place before the election. And you know, if, if that's what's going on at some level of consciousness, they're going to require findings and so on. So I, I, you know, I don't know that a paragraph like this can uh, persuade a subconscious uh, that is uh, hell-bent on another result. But if this is all, you know, totally on the level, you know, just, uh, it, it sounds convincing to me, but. Okay, well, Roger, let me ask you about a footnote in the brief uh, that stood out to us because it involves a case that we've talked about on uh, the live stream before. It's called Fisher, uh, and it, it's in footnote 10 that this case is brought up. So why don't you remind everyone why this case is important and what does the special counsel say about it? Yeah. Fisher versus United States is going to be argued next week on Tuesday, uh, the uh, 16th, uh, uh, in front of the Supreme Court. Um, and this is about uh, a very important statute for the January 6th cases. Uh, it's called uh, 18 U.S.C. 1512 C2. And it also is the basis for two of the counts against Trump in the uh, D.C. case. This is corrupt obstruction of an official proceeding. Um, uh, more than, uh, well, at least as of April 5th, there were 353 defendants charged with this in January 6th. That's almost a quarter of all of the uh, defendants, around a quarter. Um, and it's, uh, it's a two-part statute that was added in this, as part of the Sarbanes-Oxley law after Enron, it's, uh, there's 1512C1 and 1512C2. 1512C1 is narrow. It's about like uh, uh, altering, destroying, mutilating, concealing documents um, with intent to impair the object's integrity or availability for use in an official proceeding. And the second provision is um, uh, a catch-all, broad and catch-all, and it says, or otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding. So uh, the government uh, has always said that, you know, it, it means what it says, corruptly obstructing, impeding uh, an official proceeding. Um, very broad, and it covers uh, doing that through a riot. There's another provision, 1515, uh, a one something that uh, it says that a proceeding can be a congressional proceeding as well as other kinds of proceedings. So uh, that's, you know, the government's theory is that this is the natural reading. Um, but, and, and 14, at least 14 district judges read it that way in, in, in DC, but one didn't. And, um, and so uh, Carl Nichols, and that's the case, three cases that he decided are coming up. Fisher is one of them. Um, 
And they say that, no, the, 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 this broad second category is really not so broad. It, it, that word otherwise means uh, you need to look to that narrow first category. And so they say this really only applies to acts that conduct that uh, aims at um, uh, uh, evidentiary impairing um, evidentiary impairment or or, uh, or, or affecting the uh, availability of evidence um, and so you know a riot is is a different animal and doesn't apply so um, th that's the gist of the dispute and um, uh, Trump made a reference to it in the immunity brief just to say, see, they, they're, um, look at how they're uh, um, stretching to make this case against me. They're, you know, they've, they've used this statute in an unnatural way that you, the court, have already, you know, are see through and are about to reverse, basically. And, um, and, and what Smith is saying in the footnote is no, uh, I mean, f even assuming for the sake of argument that the Supreme Court does overturn, um, uh, the, the charges against Trump would still stand because uh, the false elector scheme involved, you know, basically forging documents. So it seems to fall even within uh, 1512C1. So, uh, or it would certainly within any catch-all for 1512C1. C so, um, and that's, we've, we've sort of known that, um, we've known that would be their position. Uh, honestly, um, if the court is of a mind to accept the, the, to agree with Fisher and overturn 1512C2, it is more harrowing. It is a, a, a Jack Smith's response is a little glib. Uh, it, it doesn't really wrestle with what their argument now is. The, the argument has changed as it's come up through the courts. It's sort of gotten better. Uh, you know, it's been polished. And the current argument is you need evidentiary impairment or, or something that uh, affects evidentiary avail availability, and it therefore follows that the type of hearing we're talking about has to be an evidentiary hearing. Um, and so they're saying, you know, yes, if a, a congressional proceeding could be an evidentiary hearing, but this isn't one of those. The joint session doesn't take evidence. It's a ministerial proceeding, which is actually the position, you know, that most of the time the government does take in, in the D.C. case that, you know, you, you were just supposed to open the envelopes and count the votes. That's not an evidentiary proceeding. So, uh, you know, if the court does, uh, does uh, gr you know, agree with the plaintiffs in Fisher, uh, there is a real danger that um, this could knock out those two counts, in my view. It is true. Uh, that since um, Fisher doesn't really involve, you know, hinge on that question, they, they may not answer it one way or the other. Even if they even if they do rule for Fisher, it might not be fatal yet. What we we really need to study the language, but um, it's a it it, it 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 does pose a threat to these counts. I will say the other thing that. Um, uh, there is, even though there's like one judge that has accepted this argument in the D.C., uh, in the uh, district court in D.C., um, there is no judge that has said congressional proceeding means only congressional proceedings that uh, are evidentiary. And that wasn't even argued um, before Judge Nichols. So. It would be weird to have the Supreme Court to be the first court in the land to ever say that, but who knows, they might. Um, that's, that's where that stands. All right, well, Roger, April 16th, right? 
That's yes. oral yeah. argument. Yeah, I'm I think... sure that you will be watching and have an update for us next week. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Uh, I we're, We need to go to audience questions yeah. now, okay. I think. So uh, Quinta, do you, I'm gonna hand it back to yes. you. Yes, thank you. Um, so first is a, uh, oh, sorry. Um, first is a, a question uh, from Simon from Montreal, uh, who's asking for a, a follow-up on, on a question he'd asked last week about what's been happening in the Smartmatic lawsuit against mm. Fox News. I have, oh, don't no. worry, I have an update for you. Oh, I, good, I was gonna say, Simon, we failed you. <laughs> so no, so the, the Smartmatic website actually, they have a page where they include uh, updates about their pending litigation, which is very helpful of them. Thank you, Smartmatic. Um, and the top line is that the case is moving forward. Fox had appealed a lower court's denial of their motion to dismiss. The appeals court um, also denied Fox's motion. Um, and so we are now moving forward and in the discovery process and Smartmatic appears to have filed uh, another motion recently complaining that Fox is moving too slowly. Um, so if you haven't heard anything, that is because uh, things are moving behind the scenes at the moment. Um, so there you go, Simon. We have not failed you after all. Um, all right, uh, next question is from Catherine who asks, how persuasive might the Supreme Court regard the national security professional's amicus brief that presidential criminal immunity would throw confusion into the chain of command of the armed forces? Um, I confess I have actually not uh, taken a serious read of the amicus brief, so I don't have a good sense of this. Roger, do you? Um, I did read that brief, and I still don't have a good sense of it. Uh, we it will get back to you. Catherine, <laughs> see what we just did with Simon? Next week, we will read it and we will have a response for you on what we think. Uh, although I will say, I do have an amicus brief suggestion for everyone if you want to be inter highly entertained. Uh, there, there is a, an attorney named David Boyle in Long Beach, California, who always like files these amicus briefs in various cases. Like I've seen his name before as an amicus. Uh, and he filed one before the Supreme Court in the presidential immunity case, and it is just the most wildly entertaining <laughs> brief that I've read in a long time. I'm not even going to say anything else about it, but you're, you know, just read it. <laughs> There's a Dune 2 reference at one point. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I will say about that. Next question is from Kevin, who says, on the Advisory Opinions podcast, Sarah Isker suggested that in New York, Stormy Daniels' case would likely turn on the judge's decisions about the law and jury instructions, rather than the jury needing to make tough calls. Do you agree with that? And if so, is Trump shooting himself in the foot by antagonizing the judge? Um, so I confess I have not listened to this podcast, and I'm not quite sure what Isker is referring to. Do either of you have thoughts? Well, I haven't heard the podcast. I mean, a lot of people have, have, you know, worried about whether this, uh, uh, you know, to to turn this falsification of business records into a felony from a misdemeanor, you need to have um, an enhance. You, you're trying. You need to falsify the record in order to commit or conceal another crime. And so there are three candidate other crimes, uh, and one of those is a federal, at least one of those is a federal crime that, under the Federal election, election Campaign Act. And so there is a legal question, uh, you know, uh, uh, can you, uh, does the state statute mean, uh, uh, include uh, committing a federal crime? Um, I don't think there's much, um, uh, I don't think, I mean, there's no uh, suspense in, in uh, no, uh, finding out what Justice Merchant thinks. He's, he's ruled on that. Uh, there is an issue, you know, on appeal if Trump is convicted, would eventually somebody else. To me, I don't, I don't think those are going to be, the, I think the key issues are sort of going to be factual and sort of whether the jury, there's a, there's a gut level thing. There's a jury nullification issue uh, if they don't, if they don't, if this doesn't hit them in the 
uh, you know, in the heart. Um, it, 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 it sort of, you know, there are, it's an old case. Um, it's a little, it, it, it has strange quality. So uh, if they think this smells and uh, looks like a crime, uh, that'll be okay. If they think it smells uh, and looks like a political vendetta, uh, which is what the, you know, the defense will be saying, um, it, it, I think that's the hurdle to get over. Yeah, I, I think actually the big hurdle, I mean, obviously the jury instructions are always important. Um, uh, so I don't want to discount that they are a big deal. Um, but I think, Roger, I agree with you that in this case, you know, one of the biggest threats is that you'll maybe have a hung jury or you'll have, you know, a kind of jury or a kind of jury nullification ish problem. Um, so we'll see. Um, but I think a lot of it might depend. Uh, again, this is why jury selection is so important because. <laughs> It really just depends on who it gets on that jury. All right, next question is from Jeff who asks, what is the likely sentence if Trump is convicted in the hush money trial? Um, I confess I don't have the statute in front of me, but I believe it's on the order of months. Is that well, right? Well, uh, he's, uh, he'll be eligible for probation. It's a, this is an E felony if he's convicted of, uh, if he's convicted, uh, which is the lowest level felony. Um, he's nonviolent. It's a first offender, and and so he's eligible for probation. The top uh, 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 sentence on any felony is uh, one and a third to four. They have indeterminate sentences over one year, um, so that would mean. Uh, but in reality, it would mean he would get out after one and a third because they, they still have parole and everyone gets parole. But, um, uh, I mean, there are 34 counts, so technically it's conceivable he could get a consecutive sentence, um, uh, uh, but it's very, very rare. Uh, I will yeah, say... Roger, uh, just to clarify, you're saying one and a third to four years or one and a third to four months? There, there's oh, years, that, years. Yeah, that's what I, okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks. one and a third to four years. And um, uh, and uh, Murchon is a tough judge on uh, white collar crime. So, uh, but, uh, so I, I don't know. We do know, uh, uh, you know, Trump's uh, CEO, uh, CFO, um, Weisselberg uh, got five months with, with a guilty plea, and he got five months again with a new guilty plea. Um, uh, this is going to be far from a guilty plea. This has been kicking and screaming for years. Uh, and um, uh, so... And do we know the likelihood that at sentencing he would be immediately remanded to custody, or is it common for you know uh, the, a judge to you know set a date for someone to come back and turn turn themselves in? What do we know about that kind of stuff? I I probably shouldn't uh, speculate. Uh, uh, it's been, uh, 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 in the federal system. I think it would be highly unlikely that somebody that has been out for as long as he has and, uh, you know, on appeal. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't think it would be sudden like that, but, um, uh, but I, actually I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. Okay. Hazard. We'll yeah. look into it and then <laughs> okay. discuss at a, at a, a, a different time. All right. Uh, next question is from John Hawkinson, who I think you should be able to jump in, John. All right. Uh, We almost had you, you were there for oh, a second like and then we lost you. Oh, muted. am I here oh, now? There you are. Yes, you yes. are. Uh, you know, red and white, this is a confusing UI. Hi, everybody. So this is a silly question, but it's also real. So what's the legal basis for the New York court's prohibition? For the New York court's 
prohibition and then we lost Ink you. Ink or dots the equivalent of a single pixel. Where's the line? What's the limiting principle? Can she go home and convert her ink blots into stick figures? <laughs> and of course we realize Anna doesn't want to test any of these things and get kicked out of court, but that's how judicial capture works. They start on you with ridiculous things as a cub reporter, and then where does it end? I mean, I'm with you, John. I, I Maybe we should, you know, get some media attorneys involved. I need to draw my stick figures. It's my First Amendment right. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I I don't know the answer to your question of in terms of what the uh, court, <laughs> court's authority, the basis for the court's authority to prohibit the stick figure drawings. Uh, but I'm not taking the chance because... And this is a really great development. Shout out to Al Baker with the New York court state system. Uh, he, who is the director of communications uh, with the court, has you know arranged it so that uh, a, a series of 58 media outlets have a reserve seat in the courtroom, which means that I don't have to go stand in line at like two in the morning every single night. So I'm really happy I won't be sleeping on the streets of New York in a line for like two months. Um, so, you know, I don't want to just press my luck right when I, you know, it, it, but I do think we will still have stick figure drawings. Um, it just won't be of jurors. Thank you. There you have it. <laughs> um, so the next question uh, is from Jeff and actually uh, Seb, you have asked a similar question, so I'm just going to phrase them as one. Um, can or will Jack Smith try to force Judge Cannon to make a pretrial determination as to the applicability of the Presidential Records Act and the, the question of, of whether it should be involved in the jury instructions um, before trial begins and jeopardy attaches? Roger, over to you. Uh, well, yes, I, I think uh, the, the probably he would try to do that at a minimum, through a, a motion in limine before uh, before the trial, sometime before the trial starts, and it would take the form of trying to preclude uh, Trump from making certain arguments, um, uh, from from suggesting that the Presidential Records Act has anything to do with. Uh, um, uh, being authorized to possess classified information or national defense information. Um, and the, 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 the tricky, and, and, and he'll try again to pin her down then. Um, and if she, uh, that's, that's, I think that's the way to do it. There are ways, you know, if you wait until Jeopardy attaches and the jury is sworn. There are these cases where people have brought a mandamus then, um, and it's very tricky. Um, but you sort of need to be sure that the judge is acting in good faith. And um, if she doesn't hold a conference until after the case in chief is completed, she will have a chance to enter a directed verdict of acquittal that can't be appealed. Uh, so uh, I think that it, there's enough of a scenario here, enough of a history, enough, enough of odd conduct. I mean, just, just in the middle, you know, we're months away from trial. There's no realistic trial date set for her to, you know, ask for jury instructions. And, and say, uh, even if you disagree with these, write these up as, you know, a, 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 how would you do it? Um, I mean, she's pretty serious about this. And if she refuses to give that motion in limine, uh, I think people will get the picture. I think the 11th Circuit might get the picture. I, I, I think that's doable. Um, and I, 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 I don't think she, he, he can do it right now uh, with her just saying, I'm going to rule the way every judge does, you know, at the, at the, at the conference, at the, at the uh, jury instruction conference. 
All right, next question is from Tony who asks, in the Florida documents case, does the government have any appellate or other rights under the Speedy Trial Act? For example, can his determination that the case is complex, um, that the jury verdict is more important, um, public interest in the, the redacted filing, et cetera? Um, I just asked a professor sort of that question. I, I, I would give his name, but I didn't ask, you know, specifically if, if it was okay to, um, so I won't. But uh, he, you know, I, I, the question was uh, that I posed was, is there any remedy under the Speedy, Speedy Trial Act for the government? Because ordinarily the remedy for the defendant is uh, dismissal. Um, and so obviously the government doesn't want dismissal. And so he thought, yes, theoretically, a mandamus uh, might be the remedy. But um, he also thought that, you know, given that they haven't used a day yet of the 70 days and you've got 12 motions pending, and as I described, everything's excludable until the hearing and then beyond that, if there's post-trial, you know, uh, briefing maybe 30 days after that, and you can, you know, uh, uh, stagger these, and then you have the SEPA stuff, and um, uh, I don't think she's going to have a problem delaying this till after the election. And even just discretionary stuff, oh, it's a complex case, we've had, you know, over a million documents, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we have a, a question from Dennis Dorfman um, who wanted to know uh, what will happen if Trump wins re-election uh, to these cases in different jurisdictions. So this is a, a perennial question. Um, you all love asking this question. It's an excellent question, and I have wonderful news for you. There is, I think, a hour, hour and a half long podcast um, that you can listen to where our colleagues Ben Wittes and Scott Anderson set this out. Um, it's on the Lawfare podcast. It's uh, built off a presentation that they gave. I believe uh, you can find it on YouTube with the slides. Um, and Hickey, our show master, I don't know if you would be able to find that and, and drop it in the chat for everyone. Um, but I highly recommend it. It is very, very informative and it will give you a much better answer <laughs> than we can in the limited time that remains. I don't know if either of you have any thoughts you'd like to add on that. I I have a quick nightmare yeah, version, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, he, with respect to the federal cases, he would fire Jack Smith. He would order uh, his new attorney general um, uh, to uh, dismiss these cases. And uh, if there is no judgment um, yet, and there won't be, um, a judgment means sentencing. So even if there were a conviction, uh, there would be issues about, uh, I mean, you know, Judge Chutkin would resist this, uh, Jack Smith would resist this, but we don't know how that plays out. Um, if you remember the, the Flynn case, um, Mike Flynn, he had pled guilty, uh, Barr dismissed it. Um, there was some litigation to the D.C. Circuit. It was inconclusive and, uh, and he was pardoned. So. Uh, I, I think that's my nightmare scenario with the federal cases. Quinta, before we go, I have one more. We don't have any more questions, right, to get through? We, we do, but we have time for you to do an update first. Oh, okay. So one little thing uh, that a listener has kindly reminded me of this on the Burt Jones uh, question of the statute of limitations. Uh, Georgia was actually under judicial emergency uh, for several, or actually for many months because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so that very likely means that the statute of limitations was told. So it's actually not as, uh, as a ticking time bomb as I suggested previously. Um, so thank you to listener Robert for uh, uh, pointing that out to me. I appreciate it. All right, excellent. Um, and then we have one question from Jay, um, who asks, 
Uh, this is once again on uh, Judge Cannon. I understand that Jack Smith didn't want to antagonize Judge Cannon by appealing her non-decisions and weird requests. But in her recent ruling, she seemed to be critical of the prosecution. And in any case, her actions and inaction clearly favor the defense. What would he even have to lose at this point by appealing? Well, you want to win the appeal. And uh, otherwise, you just delay the case and, and, and you you look silly and, and uh, uh, yeah. They don't want to do that. Um, I think the next, I, I think it, 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 there's a motion pending. There are two motions. There's a motion to compel, which is a, a monster motion where, where he wants a, a lot more information, uh, uh, discovery. And that is very closely linked to another motion called a, a motion for uh, uh, to dismiss based on uh, selective and vindictive prosecution. The showing goes nowhere near uh, what you need to get discovery for vindictive or uh, selective prosecution, and there is no evidence of selective or vindictive prosecution. I think she is sold on, on that idea. Uh, I think she will go with that. She will grant discovery to explore that I think that's the vehicle for appeal. All right, mark your calendars, folks. <laughs> um, we have a question from Mike who asks, um, regarding Fisher, weren't the riot and the phony electors efforts to squelch evidence by preventing Congress from considering the electors ballots? So essentially, what you know wouldn't wouldn't uh, Trump's the charges against Trump be able to persist even if the court rules the other way in Fisher? Um, that has been one of the arguments that the government has used, even even in Fisher's case. Uh, uh, I say even in Fisher's case because uh, you know there was no alternate elector scheme. Uh, they did want an argument that, well, okay, if it, if it needs to have to do with documents, this sort of does. We're blocking them from counting votes. Um, so, uh, yeah, that is uh, one of the government's arguments. Uh, and, 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 and in fact, uh, 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 I'm trying to get the Fisher brief and the immunity brief uh, s separate in my mind. Uh, but um, uh, they, they, in Fisher, they definitely want, even if the ruling goes against them, uh, they don't want it to be dis the, ca the count to be dismissed. They want an opportunity to try to meet whatever the new, uh, whatever the new standard is, because this is an interlocutory appeal. The, the charge was dismissed. He hasn't been tried yet, and 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 you're exactly right. They would they would try they would try that route. So before we wrap up, um, I want to make sure to mention our Give Butter page where you can help us by helping us fundraise for our Trump trials coverage, um, either by just donating or you can bid on various items uh, at auction, including a, a post-it note that I drew. Um, Anna, I think we, we do not yet have your drawings. Stare, I promise. They're coming. I keep They're promising every week. They're coming, OK? And it's going to be great. Everyone's <laughs> going to want one. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yes, please do take a look at that. Um, and I also wanted to flag uh, something that I believe Ben had mentioned last week, which is that we are going to be mixing up our schedule during the Manhattan trial. Um, so we will be having short, uh, ideally 20 to 30 minutes sort of dispatches uh, that you can tune into. Um, in the afternoons, evenings after the trial wraps up. We don't quite know when those will be because it depends when uh, Justice Merchan ends the day. Um, but you'll be able to tune into those on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, because Justice Merchan takes Wednesday for a different set of responsibilities. Um, and because of that Wednesday, we'll be moving this longer live stream with a sort of a broader lens to all of the various Trump activities um, to Wednesday. Um, so you'll still be able to, to find us then. Um, and I believe that all of those will be available on podcast feeds at various points. Um, 
I do not believe, however, I should say that we will be having uh, those dispatches for uh, the jury selection process. Sorry, Anna. <laughs> Um, I'm sure you would enjoy it. I'm going to be calling Tyler every day after <laughs> court and and uh, ma making him give me his own dispatch, you know. Exactly, uh, because exactly. Because I'm just so interested. Although, And I might just show up for jury selection. Who knows? There you um, go. <laughs> Uh, no, so, but we I, will I we will get those dispatches started once once the case actually goes to trial and the jury is selected. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and with that, we will wrap. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you again next week.